All right, and we are live. Yay. Hi, everyone. We're so glad that you're tuning in. I'm really so tremendously excited to welcome our esteemed keynote speaker, Professor Peter Singer. He is uh, a complete rock star philosopher. He's one of the most influential writers and thinkers of our time. And it's an honor to be hosting this discussion with your professor. I'll just reveal my fanboyness. Uh, I've I've read all your books. <laughs> I'm a I'm a I'm a big fan to say the least. And I was rereading the Life You Can Say of the tenth anniversary edition that just came out recently, and I was struck by just how compelling and how uh, relevant it is now more than ever. So I am going to uh, gracefully back away and let you begin the talk. Uh, we have around 1, 1200, over twelve hundred people who are registered for this talk for the for the summit, uh, and they all are very excited to see you. Uh, and we'll be fielding questions right after. So thank you so much, and please take it away. Thanks very much, Aaron, and, and thanks for the opportunity to speak to everybody. Um, I, uh, I'm happy to have this opportunity because I know that you're looking at opportunities to make a difference in your life, and that's one of the things that I've been talking and writing about for most of my career, um, the importance of thinking about the consequences of your choices, of thinking about what kind of life you want to lead. And I think that for many people, in fact, I think this is a kind of increasing idea, uh, the choice of what kind of life you want to lead is not just a choice about what will be comfortable for you, what will provide financial security, but also what will be meaningful in terms of meeting your values and expectations for how you can live your life and make a difference, make a positive difference, obviously, in the world as a whole. And I think we're, for people with uh, STEM backgrounds in particular, there are so many exciting opportunities to do that. Uh, it's obviously not at all easy to make that choice. I'm just going to uh, talk fairly briefly about some of the underlying values that you may think about in making that choice, that decision. And then we're going to move to Q&A because um, I think that works better online for one thing rather than a, a long talk. And also I get to find out what are your concerns and what are your interests. And uh, generally that means that questions that are of interest to most of the audience will, will get raised. So what kind of values am I talking about in terms of living uh, a meaningful or a, a worthwhile life? I think that uh, it's important to think about the world as a whole. Um, that is not just to focus on your own local community, but to think about how can you make the best possible difference to the world as a whole. Now that might sound very large, very ambitious. And of course, sometimes the best thing you can do for the world as a whole is to focus in your own area, your own region, because that may be the place you know best uh, and where you can make the biggest difference. But if you're already living in an affluent community, uh, then it's quite likely that that's not the case. It's quite likely that you could make a much bigger difference by trying to do something for people who are far away from you, but are far worse off than people in your own community. And that's really the point well, one of the points, but maybe the overall point that I make in the book that Aaron just mentioned, uh, The Life You Can Save, which is about saving lives, but it's about the point that um, we all have the opportunity to save lives and we don't have to be heroes to do it. So I start off with a little story of a man called Wesley Autry, who was uh, standing on a New York subway platform when he saw somebody topple off the tracks uh, into the path of an oncoming train. And he jumped down on top of that person, pressed their body into the gap between the two tracks and allowed the train to pass over both of them. And uh, they were both unharmed. So he saved a life and uh, I think was invited to the State of the Union address in Congress and was hailed as a hero as undoubtedly he was. But it's a lot easier to save lives than that. And you don't have to risk getting hit by a train either, because uh, there are people dying in 
some of the poorer parts of the world uh, all the time. Of course, you know, now we're very focused on people dying from COVID-19. But as a lot of the articles have pointed out, in fact, while certainly many people have died from, from COVID-19, um, compared to the numbers who die every year from conditions like malaria, uh, diarrhea, um, measles, uh, the numbers are still relatively small. And whereas we don't really know at this stage anyway how to save people from COVID-19 or not without huge costs in terms of uh, uh, lockdowns that cause unemployment and damage the economy. Um, for things like preventing deaths from malaria, it's actually really easy. You provide bed nets for people in regions where there are a lot of malaria carrying mosquitoes and you uh, educate uh, people uh, in how to use those bed nets and you reduce the number of deaths from malaria. It's been demonstrated very clearly by uh, essentially, you know, randomized trials, selecting some villages for uh, bed nets and other villages don't have the resources to cover any all villages anyway. Other villages don't get the bed nets. Uh, you measure rates of, uh, it's particularly children who die from malaria. Uh, and you find that when you distribute the bed nets, the death rate drops. And it's not expensive to do that. Um, the bed net itself is extremely cheap, but just a couple of dollars. The distribution, of course, uh, and the sending somebody to the villages to train people ends up costing more. And not every bed net saves a life, obviously, otherwise there would be nobody alive in those regions anyway. Um, but if you distribute a reasonable number of bed nets, you will save a life. And you can do that for uh, amounts that um, you know, generally people who are earning an income can donate without substantial hardship um, might be a couple of thousand dollars. Uh, so uh, these are things that, that we can do already. And so one way in which your life and career can have an impact is simply if you can earn reasonably comfortably and uh, donate a portion of your earnings to the most effective charities. Uh, I should also mention that The Life You Can Save uh, is not only a book, um, but it's an organization. Uh, you can go online and find thelifeyoucansave.org and you can find their recommended charities, charities that have been independently vetted as being highly effective and ones that uh, are worthy to receive your support. So that's one thing that you can do. But but given that I'm talking to students, uh, as I said, students particularly in STEM areas, uh, setting out on your career paths, there's something, um, a, a bigger and more meaningful choice that you have to make. And that is, what kind of career are you going to lead? Uh, what choices will you make? And I think there's, uh, again, there's, there's a need for more thought to go into this than most people usually do. Uh, there's um, an, an, another organization, uh, not, not one that I've been directly involved with, but that I followed with interest called 80,000 Hours. You can find that uh, 80,000hours.org online too. Uh, and that figure 80,000 hours is somebody's calculation of the number of hours that you are likely to spend in your career over your lifetime. So that's quite a lot of hours. Now, you would think it would be worth spending some fraction of that time, some proportion of that time, thinking about what career you'll follow, what choice will you make? So um, you might, for example, not spend 80,000 hours, of course, doing that, nor even 10%, 8,000 hours. Um, but how about 800 hours? Um, that would be 1% of the time you're gonna spend in your career. That's a lot of time though, actually. You know, does anybody really spend 800 hours thinking about their career choice? I think most people spend far less than that. Um, so, you know, less than one, one tenth of 1%, uh, 80 hours would be, I think, a reasonable average. Um, so I think it's worth thinking about. And if you go to the website of 80,000hours.org, you'll find a lot of ideas and a lot of discussion about possible careers that can be beneficial. Um, 
sometimes people write to me and say, what do you think I ought to do? Um, I find those questions very difficult to answer because I don't know the people who are writing to me, what their aptitudes are, their skills and so on. But uh, I do think that thinking about this and considering options that will suit your, your skills uh, is a really important thing to do. And as I've said, I do urge you to think about this globally. So for me, the values that you should be considering are things like, how can I make the world a better place? And well, there are various candidates for what we mean by a better place here. One pretty obvious and strong candidate is to say, uh, a place where there is less suffering, um, where people have better lives. And I wouldn't limit it to people either. I would think where there's less suffering of animals as well, any being who can suffer or to can't. Uh, and um, so then uh, the question is, how can I contribute to that? In what way can my work contribute to it? And again, coming back to what I said earlier, uh, it's where people have less that you can more easily make a big difference, uh, and certainly at, at lower cost. Um, if, if, as I said before, you can save a life for two or three thousand dollars by donating to the Against Malaria Foundation, uh, then you can't really do that in the United States. Uh, it's you know, it, it's 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 almost impossible because in terms of providing healthcare that people need, uh, it'll already be provided and uh, it's much more expensive to provide extra that's really going to make a difference. Even people who don't have health insurance in the United States can walk into an emergency room and they can't be turned away if uh, turning them away would endanger their life. So uh, that obviously doesn't happen to people in poorer countries. Uh, people in the United States um, can get food stamps if they are hungry and, and the value of the food stamps is already more than the World Bank's extreme poverty line of $1.90 US per day. Uh, so, you know, if they're reasonably sensible about getting the food stamps and what they buy with them, um, they're not really going to be starving without food uh, as some people are. And again, the COVID-19 epidemic uh, pandemic is disrupting things and causing people to, to go hungry again. So uh, think about where you can make the, the biggest impact on the world. Uh, and as I say, I think it's going to be in predominantly in those low income countries. Uh, and you can do that in various ways. And I hope some of those options will come up in the questions that uh, I hope you will be asking me soon. Uh, so, you know, as I said, I don't want to talk for too long about this. If you do want uh, more details and if you want to refresh your memory of the kinds of things that I've been talking about, uh, Aaron mentioned having read the updated 2019 edition of The Life You Can Save. Uh, the good news is that you don't need to pay for that um, and you don't need to leave your computer. Uh, just go to thelifeyoucansave.org uh, slash the book. You'll see the tab when you go to thelifeyoucansave.org and you'll be able to download completely free uh, an ebook version of that. Or if you prefer listening to an audio book, there's an audio book version as well. Uh, and I was very pleased that a number of celebrities agreed to read a chapter of the audio book uh, completely free. So if uh, Kristen Bell is one of your favorite actresses, you can you can hear her read a chapter. Uh, if like me, you're a fan of uh, the singer songwriter, Paul Simon, he reads a chapter. Uh, Stephen Fry, the BBC host, uh, there's a lot of other people reading chapters of that. So that's another way to get it. Um, and it will give you a lot more information and a lot of time to think about and go back over the issues that we're gonna be talking about today. But now I'll stop and uh, invite you to ask your questions. Sweet. Thank you, thank you so much, Professor. Really, we're glad to have you with us. Um, I have a couple of questions before we open it up to the audience, which is one I'd like to, to mention. So I studied ethics at Brown University and one of my professors there encouraged me to think of variations on the classic trolley problem that was first devised by Philip Afoot. In mine, I came up with a runaway trolley 
that would either destroy an oncology research laboratory or the Louvre Museum in Paris. And I asked this to friends and colleagues and other philosophy professors, and I would usually get like a 50-50 split. And it seems that even within utilitarian, with utilitarian calculations, there is room for disagreement that seems to be purely based on taste. So how then can we settle these disagreements when cause areas are apples and oranges and incomparable? Uh, to give an example, if a genie popped out of a bottle and told me that he would either donate a billion dollars towards ending racism or a billion dollars towards ending climate change, I am not sure what I would pick. And I'm guessing that many people watching this would disagree purely as a matter of preference. So my question is specifically on disagreements in preference. Sure. Um, I, I, I don't actually agree that these things are just matters of taste. Um, I do think that there's things to be said and, and reasoned about in them. Uh, when you originally posed the trolley problem of the oncology lab and the Louvre, I wanted to know how good this oncology lab was, right? There's lots of oncology labs around the world. Uh, we have made some progress in fighting cancers. I'm not saying that they're, they're no good at all. Obviously, they are. Um, but if you postulate that this uh, oncology lab is, you know, on uh, on the brink of discovering a cure for major forms of cancer, um, and uh, if it's destroyed, that will n not happen or it will set back the fight to do this by 20, 20 years, let's say, um, I'm going to destroy the Louvre rather than the oncology lab. But if it's just a typical oncology lab that's sort of nibbling around the edges of fighting cancer, uh, you know, then maybe, maybe not. Um, but uh, actually, the other one that you asked, um, climate change or racism, I don't have any doubt about that. I would stop climate change um, because uh, climate change, you know, in, in a way, they, they go together because climate change is going to be worst for the poorest people in the world who largely are uh, overwhelmingly are non-white. Um, they're the people who are, for example, uh, subsistence farmers in sub-Saharan Africa who are dependent on rainfall to survive, for the, to grow their crops. Um, and when rainfall patterns change, they'll become climate refugees. Uh, you know, people in rich countries are going to be relatively protected. So it doesn't mean that climate change isn't going to be terrible, but uh, they'll be somewhat better off. Um, so uh, I think that that's going to make a much bigger difference in the long run. I hope that we will get there eventually in overcoming racism anyway. Um, but if we don't slow climate change, uh, we're not going to be making any progress. Right. The quickest way to end racism is to destroy the world, apparently. So I, I, I guess I agree. Um, similarly to the previous question, there's while there's differences in preference between cause areas, there's also a fair bit of variability when it comes to risk tolerance. For instance, I could donate a million dollars to buy mosquito nets, or I could donate a million dollars to be to one of the laboratories working on a malaria vaccine currently, or I could donate a million dollars, which is riskier still, to an initiative that seeks to use genetic engineering to completely wipe out the mosquitoes that cause malaria. This would be a high risk, high reward option. But my question is, how can we settle differences in risk tolerance when it comes to charitable giving? So if the odds are, if, you, if we calculate the odds so that they actually come out the same, then I do think in a sense that is a matter of choice. In other words, um, suppose, suppose the benefit is save a thousand lives and there's something that will have, uh, well, sorry, let's say the benefit of save, there's, you could save a thousand lives, but there's only a one in a thousand chance that you'll do so. Um, or you could save one life uh, uh, with a certainty of saving one life, or you could save a uh, hundred lives with a one in 10 chance of doing so. Um, I think they're all equivalent. Um, I don't think it matters which you choose. And, you know, in the long run, if enough people make the risky choices, you'll save the same number of lives. But but the problem is, I suppose, that um, people often are, are risk avoiders. And so they will put more money into something where there's a certainty of saving one life than they will put into something where there's a one in a thousand chance of saving a thousand lives or a one in a million chance of saving a million lives uh, and a one in a billion chance of saving a billion lives they're not likely to put money into at all. So I think that's part of the problem um, and we should perhaps be more concerned about uh, reducing these risks. Uh, 
I've been talking about global poverty in particular, um, and that's one of the main things that I've been working on with The Life You Can Save. But as part of the broader movement known as effective altruism, uh, a lot of people are concerned with the risk of our species becoming extinct. Um, and those are relatively small risks, uh, depending which risk you talk about. But uh, a, a lot of people in the effective altruism movement think that there's not enough uh, research and thought going into preventing risks of extinction. That That's such a huge catastrophe that um, we undervalue it because you know, emotionally, the idea that we reduce the risk of extinction from, uh, you know, 0.01% to 0.001% doesn't mean a lot. But really, when you consider how bad extinction would be, that should mean a lot. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So a question somewhat related to that, which is uh, the life you can save in the book is it's fairly human centric. And it makes a very compelling case for global global poverty amelioration and focusing on global health and development. However, you first made your mark in the public eye as an animal rights active advocate. And more recently, the effective altruism movement has adopted a new cause area of long-termism, as you mentioned, focusing on things like bio-risk reduction or preventing malevolent AI from taking over the world. And no one in the EA movement denies that any of the issues are important, but it seems that EA has split into distinct camps with some people focusing on global health and poverty issues, some people focusing on animal welfare, and some people focusing on long-termism. Being candid, are you happy with the way the EA movement has morphed over the years? Or do you feel that the original message of reducing extreme poverty and lessening preventable diseases has been diluted? Uh, so at the moment, I'm reasonably happy with the way it's, it's uh, developed. Uh, there certainly have been moments when I thought that there was too much effort, too much emphasis on, on long-termism. Um, there was a conference held in San Francisco, an EA Global Conference some time ago, at which I think Elon Musk was there and a few other people. And, and the reports that appeared of that um, suggested that, you know, there were these people giving very abstract uh, uh, talks about focusing on uh, small risks of long-term future or about uh, why we should invest in colonizing Mars because that might be a way in which we can prevent the species to become extinct if there's some catastrophe here on Earth. Um, uh, and and that gave the impression that EA was really for people with, as I say, you know, somewhat somewhat unusual, put it that way, um, priorities that, that we're not going to appeal to a wide public. And because this was at an early, relatively early stage of the EA movement, I worried that this was going to reduce the number of people who would get involved in EA. Whereas when you talk about global poverty or about animal suffering, um, they're both very concrete things that people can relate to and that a lot of people want to want to stop and can see that they can stop them or they can reduce them anyway, they can't stop them completely. Uh, and so it seemed to me important for the effective altruism movement to have a lot of focus on those issues in order to develop the movement, bring more people into the movement. And if some of those people who then came into the movement decided on further thought and reflection that uh, long-termism is an important thing to do, um, they would then work in that area. And that's that's fine. I, I don't deny the importance of the long-termist approach, but um, I do worry about narrowing the base of the movement to only people who focus on those kinds of things. Yeah, I worry about that too sometimes. And then the last question that I have uh, before we open up for the audience is, it's entirely conceivable that someone watching this will be the next tech billionaire. Mark Zuckerberg was famously in college when he started Facebook, and Mark now donates millions of dollars to charities through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Uh, unfortunately, Facebook is a vast empire that also causes real harm to people in the form of spreading misinformation and propaganda, and there's a lot of you know, qualms we can raise with Facebook. In some ways, is that not then the fruit of the poison tree? Does it somehow delegitimize the good of donations if they are ill-gotten in the first place? And couldn't we make a reasonable argument that Mark has a moral responsibility to spend his time and his money ameliorating the cause, the, the harms that Facebook has caused? Uh, I do think that anybody who starts an enterprise and becomes aware of the fact that it's causing serious harms has a responsibility to try to eliminate or at least 
reduce to the greatest extent possible those harms. So, um, yes, I think uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and others involved with Facebook do have a responsibility to try and reduce the harms. And I, know, I see some signs that they're trying to do that. Now, I'm not sufficiently expert in how this can be done and what they're doing to say whether what they're doing is enough to meet that responsibility. Arguably, it's not. But um, they're more aware, aware of it now than they were in 2016, say, when, uh, you know, arguably the misinformation distributed on Facebook contributed to the election of Donald Trump, which I regard as a greater disaster than anything that uh, all of the billions that um, Facebook has and that the Zuckerberg Chan Foundation might distribute um, is likely to to remedy. Um, but uh, so, yes, I think there is there is that responsibility. But use the term delegitimize and i'm that's a little foreign to my way of thinking it's not whether it's legitimate or not it's rather a matter of balancing the harms that you cause with the good that you do so you know some people say i i, I talked briefly in, in what i said about um you know one one possible thing for a career path is to earn enough money to be comfortable and to have something substantial to donate to the Against Malaria Foundation or one of the other recommended charities of the life you can save. Um, and often people say something like that, well, you know, if I went to Wall Street, I'd be involved in all sorts of, you know, unscrupulous financial deals that, that uh, exploit and harm people. And I wouldn't want to do that. Um, I tend to think about how much difference would you be making by going to Wall Street? Would you be making things worse? Um, and Probably the answer is not, right? If you're a person with a conscience on Wall Street, you're actually, even if you do get dirty hands at some extent, if that's unavoidable in terms of being a success, you would probably do less of that than other people who might be holding your position if you hadn't gone there. Um, so I don't think it, it, it delegitimizes the good that you would do with the large income that you earned and the amount that you could do. I think that's still very much worth doing. Um, you know, but as I say, you, you you would you ought to try to prevent doing harm in whatever occupation you're in, as well as trying to do good. That makes a lot of sense. All right, we have our first question from the audience, which I, I like this a lot. How can one determine how much to give towards ending extreme poverty versus national wealth redistribution as someone who is profiting off of the wage theft of others? Which is an interesting question, especially just because um, it's easier to target like billionaires. You know, once we have a billionaire, we can go after them and be like, hey, you should donate this. It's very hard to create a giant message that would affect, you know, that would reach 300 million people in the US to all donate 10% of their income or something. Yeah, right. Um, and that's a, 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 a good question, but it is relevant to say, what can I do? What's, what's within my power to do? Um, and I do have the power to donate some of my income. Obviously, how much you have the power to donate will depend on how much you earn and you know what your responsibilities are. You know whether you're who you're providing for. Um, but uh, it's not in my power to change the tax system or the economic system in some other way that provides for a more equitable distribution of income. I can do something about that. You know, insofar as I have a public voice, I can speak about that. I can point to the fact that uh, the kind of multiple between the that the CEO earns of the average workers income in the United States is far higher than it typically is in Europe uh, uh, or in Japan for that matter um, and uh, that there's no real evidence that uh, the higher higher multiple in the US produces a stronger or better economy so you can point it you can you can be an advocate for uh, more steeply progressive income tax scales and, and a whole lot of other things. But essentially, um, that's an extremely difficult thing to change. Mm -hmm. So my choice is, you know, suppose that I am able to donate a proportion of my income to an effective cause. Should I donate it to uh, causes that are helping people in extreme poverty? Or should I donate it to some kind of lobby for a fairer tax scale? Well, um, if I were convinced that the lobby for the fairer tax scale had a chance of succeeding and it really needed my donation that could make a difference, then there's some argument about maybe that's what I should do. But unless that seems a reasonable, reasonably plausible outcome, 
I think I should give to where I know that I am going to make a positive difference. And that's my own way of, uh, if you like, having a more just distribution of income. Um, yeah. If I get paid more uh, by Princeton University than uh, uh, other workers who work just as hard as I do in, in different fields, um, I can help to remedy that by distributing uh, a proportion of, of what I earn to people who are living on that uh, $2 a day basic, you know, uh, World Bank's extreme poverty line. And uh, that's quite likely to be one of the best things I can do. And incidentally, if you do want to actually just distribute cash to poor people, uh, another of the recommended charities for the life you can save is an organization called Give Directly, and it will do just that. Um, for every dollar you give, it distributes about 90 cents to some of the poorest people in the world. Uh, and it follows up and makes sure that what they're doing actually with that money benefits them and their families in the long run. So have a look at that if you're interested in income distribution. For sure, they're a fabulous organization. Can't recommend them more highly. Michael Fay, who's the CEO, he was a, a speaker at last year's summit as well. Oh, great! Fab, Very good. Yeah, yeah, I know Michael. Cool dude. Um, we have a question that's somewhat related, which is: you speak a ton about individual altruism, but what about advocating for systemic structural changes built into government specifically? And I know that in the life you can save, you had a chapter on the U.S. aid and how it kind of perversely benefits uh, American farmers. It's like, for instance, a grain, like grain donation to foreign countries has to be U.S. grain, which actually winds up causing all these like overhead issues and just like crashes the market price of grain in the local areas. So if it seems that, you know, poverty could be sh completely ameliorated by a shifting of, you know, like the U.S.'s national budget in terms of foreign aid, aid how should that make us feel as individuals? It seems pretty disempowering. Yeah, it is disempowering. Um, that seems to be the reality, actually, that uh, a lot of USAID is geared towards supporting uh, farmers in the Midwest and, and also actually the US shipping industry. There's also a requirement that it be shipped on US ships, which tend to be more expensive than others. Uh, um, it is disempowering and it's very hard to, to do anything about it is the problem. Um, so... That, that gets back to the sort of thing that we were talking about before in terms of changing the tax scale as well, um, something else very difficult to do. Uh, and I, I do think that it's probably too, too tough a struggle that you know, maybe if we elect better governments, things will change, but you know, the USAID system has been like it is now for basically for a long time through different administrations, George W. Bush, uh, Barack Obama, Donald Trump um, uh, didn't really change all that all that much, so it's clearly difficult to change. Another example I give in my book is is the uh, agricultural subsidies that the U.S. pays, um, which uh, are enormous, and some of which go to well, quite a lot of which go to wealthy people. So, one example I talk about is uh, the U.S. subsidize has a subsidizes its cotton industry, mm -hmm. and because it subsidizes its cotton industry, um, which goes to a lot of cotton farmers, some of whom are poor black cotton farmers in the South, but you know, most of the, a lot of money goes to wealthy cotton growers. Um, that means that US farmers can sell their cotton on the world market for a lower price than small peasant holder cotton growers in some of the poorest countries in the world, countries like Mali and Burkina Faso in uh, West Africa. Uh, and so that impoverishes them. And it also, of course, is a waste of US tax revenue. And you would think that there would be a bipartisan lobby against this, both people who want to help peasant farmers in Africa and people who say we shouldn't be wasting our tax revenue by subsidizing wealthy uh, wealthy US farmers. Um, but despite the obvious logic of that, um, and you know, both there are both Republicans and Democrats who are opposed to the farm subsidy uh, law, it efforts to really change it significantly have failed. So that's what makes me pessimistic about those efforts and makes me think um, maybe it's, it's, it's better if I just donate directly to people who need it. For sure. That makes sense. Uh, when speaking about the response to Mark Zuckerberg question, you said that balancing the harm that you cause with the good that you do, that sounds like a way of allowing privileged people 
doing bad things to feel better about themselves by giving a bit of money to charity. I see we I, we see this often with optical allyship or greenwashing or hey, you could take this transatlantic flight, but just donate a couple of bucks to this carbon offsetting charity and you could feel good about yourself. That seems to not ring true to many of the alt altruists that I know, even effective altruists who seem to feel that there's some sort of inequality. There's no transitive property or no equality of you know, goodness and badness that can be easily kind of distributed. It really does feel ill-gotten if we're doing harm and then doing good with the benefits that we've incurred from doing that harm. Is there any way of reconciling that or do we just have to live with the fact that we're always going to be living under the thumb of, uh, you know, there, there's no way of getting around this type of these, these kind of harm benefit exchange rates? Uh, I don't think there's any way of avoiding harm benefit exchange rates. Um, you know, there's a sense in which everything we do causes some harm. If, if say, you know, we, we mean citizens in affluent countries, we're, um, you know, on a per capita basis, we're among the highest fossil fuel emitters in the world. Um, uh, and just continuing to live and run our homes and offices and so on, um, most of us will be locked into that. So there's, you know, very few of us are really able to go and live off the grid or have completely solar power. And so, so we are causing harms um, and we have to hope that we are producing sufficient benefit to outweigh that. And so I think that trade-off is there. Um, some of the things you mentioned where you say, you said something like, well, rich people get to feel okay by doing some good. Um, they shouldn't feel okay if they're not clearly doing more good than the harm they're producing. Um, uh, so, and, and you then talked about greenwashing and, and such things. Uh, if it's greenwashing, then it's not actually doing enough. Um, but the idea of saying, we are going to turn this company completely green and we are going to stop emitting fossil fuels and we are going to produce, I don't know, solar panels that are going to reduce uh, fossil fuel emissions for others as well. Um, if they're really doing that and all of that's true and it's making a much you know, bigger positive difference than, than the negative difference the company is making, then that is a good thing. So um, I think the concern is, you know, well, the facts could be twisted and if the facts are twisted, then it's no good. But um, if the facts are really such that you clearly are doing a lot more good than the harm that you're doing, uh, then that's okay. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I understand that people are uneasy about this because very often people then do justify all sorts of horrible things, um, uh, and it's difficult to prove that this justification is false. But but the devil is in the details. You've got to look at the details to see whether it's right or not. That makes sense. We have another question, which is: How do you draw the line between helping others in less fortunate countries and interfering with their lives and their governments? Is there an arrogance associated with assuming that we can or should attempt to step in? Yeah, I know people talk about this. They talk about the white savior mentality. Um, uh, and obviously we should listen to local people. We should uh, understand their knowledge. We should understand what they actually want. Um, and we should talk to them about, would they like some assistance of some kind? And if so, what is it? And uh, but you know, as long as if if we do that, then I I don't really accept the idea that because we're white and they're black, we shouldn't be helping them, or there's something wrong with us helping them. And I mean, the fact is that uh, we have the resources that they don't have, and uh, we can distribute some of those resources to them and can help to improve their lives. And if we if they're clear about that and they want that assistance, we talked about give directly for a moment, right? It's not as if give directly walks into villages and starts pushing cash on people. Um, they talk to people in the village about would they like give directly to come to the village and to do this and this and this. And I'm, to the best of my knowledge, no village actually has turned them away, but I'm sure if a village did say, no, we like our lifestyle as it is, we don't want this, um, then they wouldn't go there. So to me, that's what it's about. Um, it's not It's not arrogance. It's uh, a recognition of the fact that we have resources. And again, you could say, well, we acquired them through colonialism or imperialism or something like that. If, if, if that's your view of how we got rich, some, I know some people believe that. Um, uh, but still, uh, given that we have them, 
uh, the best thing we can do is to use them to the greatest possible benefit of everybody who can benefit from them. Yeah, that makes sense to me. I think that it's a lot of people will say, oh, it's the underlying system that perpetuates the inequalities that be, but that's a easy way to paralyze yourself into not doing any action. Exactly. Fact, what are you going to do to change the underlying system? Um, right. how, how are we going to do that? Um, those are Which, the sorts of... Yeah, it brings us to another question that Samia asked uh, earlier. I'm going to find it. Uh, wait, where was it? Oh, no. It was about... Samia asked this question of what are non-financial ways of getting involved? Uh, for instance, like if donating feels, for, for whatever reason, let's just assume either you're, you can't afford it, like what are ways, especially perhaps for well, many of the folks who are watching this, which are computer scientists, uh, what are ways of helping that are not monetary? Oh, well, absolutely, there are. Um, and that's why I talked about uh, career career options before. Maybe I didn't say enough about that. But um, clearly there, there are many things you can do depending on, on your talents and opportunities so we've been talking about climate change for example as uh, something that we need to do something about so there are lots of opportunities in the research area relating to climate change for producing clean energy for distributing clean energy um, for developing ways of storing clean energy uh, and i'm sure many of the people in the audience will know a lot more about these things than i do but uh, you know, going into a, a research career path where you can work on those things um, could be more useful than going into Wall Street earning huge amounts of money and donating them. Um, and, and that's, you know, I've just chosen clean energy because we were talking about that. You could talk about agriculture, you could talk about educational technologies, uh, you could talk about a huge number of, uh, talk about health, obviously, you could talk about a huge number of, of different things that people can do. Um, and some of the technical developments, uh, even that were developed for the rich world, have proved to be tremendously beneficial in the in the developing world. So, mobile phones are an example. You know, they're uh, very useful for us, but um, they're even more useful in countries where there is no infrastructure and there therefore are no landline phones. Um, and people in rural villages were completely isolated from information. So, let's say if they had surplus. Uh, grain to sell, they were completely at the mercy of the grain dealers who came to the village and said, oh, no, you know, the price is this. But and, and they were completely ignorant as to whether it was or wasn't. Now they can say, hey, wait a minute, if I took this grain uh, 10 miles down the road, I can see that there it's selling for more than you're offering me. So I'm not going to sell it to you. Um, so there's tremendously beneficial um, things that technology can do for people throughout the world um, and not only for the rich that maybe was the initial market that the developers thought about. Yeah, that makes sense. We have a question from one of our teammates, Christina, who I'll pop onto the stream for a second. Christina. Hello. So, Hi, Christina. Um, hello. So I want to return briefly to um, the earlier discussion of, of long-termism. And I think that it is true that it's somewhat outlandish to be focused on Mars rather than um, some of the crises on Earth. But um, there are other like, more well-known um, existential risks like climate change and uh, potential AI research that um, perhaps some people here will be working on in the future. And um, in your mind, I, I'm curious to know what degree of focus on long-termism um, is ideal for you? What, what degree is appropriate? If you if you can decide, yeah, um, I, I, you know, I don't know that I personally have a particular distribution of interest, a proportion that I could mention. Um, I again, I think it does depend on your particular skills and aptitudes. So you mentioned the concern that uh, artificial general intelligence might put an end to our species, might uh, you know not be aligned with human values and. Uh, uh, find that we're a nuisance and get rid of us. Uh, now, um, if you are already in the AI field, um, that might well be uh, an interest that you might take up and put quite a lot of thought into. Uh, um, but if you're not in that field, then I don't know, my thinking is that there are some very smart people already doing research in that area um, and that there's not much that I could contribute to it, I can talk about it, the awareness of it. But um, you know, I, I find that there, when I do talk to people who know the field better, 
some of them take it seriously and some of them say, well, that's probably never going to happen. But if it does happen, this is a sort of super intelligence that's smarter than us. If, if it is going to happen, it's, it's going to be another 50 years down the track. And we don't know enough about how it would happen to actually do anything very effective in terms of stopping it happening at this stage. Um, I should also mention, you mentioned climate change, and, and as I've already said, I've been very concerned about climate change. Uh, the long-termers tend actually not to be that interested in climate change because they don't see it as an existential risk, where we define existential risk as one which will actually end the uh, species or end intelligent life on this planet. Um, I've talked to a few of them, and they tend to say, yeah, yeah, well, you know, climate change could be pretty bad. Um, but uh, the species will go on surviving, even if it only survives in Siberia and northern Canada or somewhere like that. Um, it's not an extinction risk and eventually will repopulate. And because they're thinking of the very long term, you know, the next billion years maybe, uh, the fact that this sort of several billion people will die or become refugees as a result of it over the next 50 years um, is just a little blip. Uh, and... Uh, to me, you know, that's the kind of thinking that is going to make it hard to attract a lot of people to the effective altruism movement because most people don't think of all of the terrible things that could happen in the next 50 years as just, you know, an infinitesimally small blip in terms of the billions of years that our species might live. Okay, thank you. So uh, maybe the movement should not turn more to long-termism because it should stay in the realm of what people think and how people uh, morally see the world? So my ideal vision for the movement is that the movement does, as you say, stay in the way that most people think about the world in terms of thinking about now and in the reasonably foreseeable future, but that there are there is a small subgroup of the EA movement which is actively thinking about these issues, which is uh, researching them, which is pinpointing the ones that we can do something about. Um, by the way, for those of you out there who are interested in learning more about this, uh, Toby Ord, who's one of the founders of the Effective Altruism Movement, has a book called The Precipice, which came out uh, just a few months ago, uh, which I recommend as a good discussion of the various risks. Um, so, you know, there are good people like Toby and Will McCaskill and uh, um, Nick Bostrom and others who are thinking about this, and I think that's great, and I uh, hope that they have the research and res the resources to do the research and um, <clears throat> to build up that group. But as I said, I, I think the main sort of public face of effective altruism should be related to suffering that's more here and now. All right, thank you so much. Awesome, thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Uh, we have another question, only time for maybe one or two more questions. Um, one from Samia, which I like, which is, if you could ask everyone watching this to do one thing, regardless of if they've done it before, what would you ask them to do? <laughs> okay. Um, so that's difficult. Um, obviously, uh, you know, I'd like people to go to the website of The Life You Can Save and, and look at, find some effective charities and support them and, and think about that. I'd like them to go to 80,000 Hours and think about their career. And another thing which we haven't talked about much, but you did mention my involvement in the animal rights movement, um, and this is also relevant to climate change, is it'd be great if everybody would actually turn vegan, um, reduce animal suffering immensely, uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions greatly, uh, and probably produce a healthier long life for all of you out there. That's definitely true. I, I will say I read one of your books five years ago, uh, and I put it down and I was like, well, can't eat meat anymore. And that was like a staunch carnivore, man. I was, I would eat like meat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And now I, I haven't eaten, I haven't eaten meat in five years. So thanks oh, a lot. Congrats. Peter congratulations. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. yeah, it's good. Yeah, actually, I have um, my next book is coming out in October is called Why Vegan. It's, it's a collection of previously published works of mine. But um, I hope you'll pick up that when it does come out. Nice. Fabulous. We have uh, one more question that we wanted to ask, which is from Sarah. Uh, do we have ethical obligation to donate locally or nationally when we live in a country with a failing social wel welfare program in many areas? So if you think of the United States, I still think uh, the answer is no, because it takes a lot more money to make a difference to a family in, in the U.S. So in the U.S., the poverty line, last time I checked for a family of four, was $23,000 a year. 
So suppose you, whereas I said, the World Bank's poverty line is around two US dollars a year. So, so let's say you know seven hundred and fifty dollars. Sorry, two two US dollars a day. So let's say around seven hundred and fifty dollars a year. So imagine you've got a thousand dollars that you can donate. Where are you going to make the most difference? You donate it to a family that already earns twenty three thousand dollars, or you donate it to a family that earns less than a thousand dollars? Obvious, you know that that answer is so obvious. You, if you give somebody who earns seven hundred fifty dollars a year a thousand dollars, they can do things that they could never ever afford otherwise. Things like um, replacing their leaky thatched roof with a corrugated iron roof, which will keep them dry, will keep their food, their grain storage dry, um, and also in the long run will be cheaper because it will last for many years without needing repair, whereas thatch needs to be replaced annually. So, you know, you make a, a life-changing difference to them for $1,000. You don't do that for $1,000 with a family in the U.S., unfortunately. That's true. There's a huge difference. Okay, I lied. There's one last question. You said we should all become vegan. Does that include sustainably raised meat? Please say no, according to <laughs> So if you really are talking about sustainably raised meat and uh, good animal welfare standards um, uh, and humane slaughter, Maybe not, but um, you know, a lot of people have misconceptions about that. For example, people say, "Well, I only eat grass-fed beef," um, and they think that's more sustainable. Uh, it's not. It's not true at all. Um, you know, cattle emit methane all their lives. Uh, it takes longer, actually, for a, a steer to get to market weight eating grass than eating corn. So it will emit more methane on grass than it will emit eating corn. Um, so it's not sustainable. Uh, free range chicken, maybe, you know, chickens actually living outside. Uh, maybe that's sustainable. Um, you still have to grow grain to feed them. From, they don't get most of their nutrition from the grass. Uh, so there's a lot less sustainable meat than people typically think there is. Yeah, I wish it weren't the case, but unfortunately it is. Oh, wow. thank you so much, Peter. This has been really eye opening and insightful. Um, and it's just been a pleasure to host you here. And, and we hope you'll come back because we really, it's just very engaging. Um, and that's it for the final night, uh, for the first day of the Impact Summit. We will uh, see you all tomorrow at 10 a.m. for an IBM technical workshop. It's uh, really such a pleasure to have you, Peter. Again, thank you so much. I wish we could give Great. you such a, an audible round of applause. But it's just no problem. Great. Thanks for setting it up, Aaron. I'm delighted to have had the chance to speak to you and to all of the other people in your audience. And I hope the rest of the Impact Summit goes very well. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.